Today, uh, I want to talk about I want to talk about manhood, actually. Uh, over the last 11 years that City Light has existed, we have, <clears throat> I think rightly, spoken about women a lot as a, a, a right corrective to a culture that has historically, and even still, uh, either subjugated women or prevented women from uh, really flourishing and, and stepping into um, the areas of life that God would have them lead and grow in and, and move into. So we've spoken a lot about women and not enough about men, about what it is to be a man. Uh, and we need good men. In our culture at the moment, it's actually a really uh, interest, interesting thing to say we need, we need men and we need good men. Because they're, over the last, again, the same period of time, the last decade or so, uh, what it means to be a man has, uh, it's not been put under the spotlight actually, it's been removed from public discussion. Uh, in the last week or so, in fact, regularly, but especially in pre- preparation for today, <clears throat> I've tried to listen as broadly as I can, to read as broadly as I can, uh, and to speak with people as broadly as I can from across uh, political persuasions and, and cultural um, preferences, you might say. And uh, each of these people, from very progressive all the way through to very conservative, although, again, I don't really like that, that uh, you know, linear spectrum. We spoke, we spoke about that briefly last week. Uh, the whole way across, there is a, an acknowledgement that there is a crisis of manhood in our culture, that men don't know what it means to be a man. And so, again, from the, from the most... And, and, man, interestingly, the, from among all, every single one, who I would say are more on the progressive end of the cultural or political spectrum, every single one of them, in interview or in written form, all started with an apology saying, oh, I'm so sorry, but I have to talk about men. Like, sheepishly bringing it up. Because the data, these researchers, journalists, the data tells them there's a crisis among men in our culture, not just in Australia, but in, the, in industrialized Western nations, there's a crisis among men, not just young men, but across the, across the ages. Uh, they're embarrassed. It seems like they're embarrassed to be advocating for men. Or they're sheepish to come out and say, oh, they're, they're actually, there seems to be something distinct and necessarily embodied about manhood. Um, even though that's what the data, again, that's what the data is telling them. They're still sheepish in coming forward and saying, oh man, it seems like there's something embodied in manhood and it's something important and it's something that men, young men and old men, are not seeing either exampled or not being taught about and so they are adrift. The most generous read is that this hesitation from people mostly on one end of, again, that cultural spectrum or political spectrum, best read is they want to advocate rightly for women and where women have been held back, uh, and they, they don't want to compromise good gain and right gains and necessary correctives. That's the best read. Or that they see people maybe on the other end of, their, of the political or cultural spectrum who they might consider political enemies or people who they don't agree with, and yet the data says uh, we actually agree with them on some of these points, but we can't put our name to it because then we'll be putting our name alongside theirs. That's, that's my best read. But either way, the facts are people seem to be very hesitant to talk about the fact that men are struggling. There's confusion in Western Western culture about what it means to be a man. I'm of the opinion that people are embarrassed to say we need men. We need good men. And it's good and necessary to have men around who are men. Uh, It's my opinion that a hesitancy as a culture to say that is actually feeding into the problem of men not knowing what it means to be a man and men being hesitant to live in their or exercise their God-given manhood. Does that make sense? So the more we retreat from this because it's uncomfortable to talk about it, the less people see and hear what it is to be a good man. And so it just contributes to the problem all the more. One side of a culture at odds won't advocate for men or manhood and have contributed to a rush of men to the other side who are willing to talk about it, who aren't embarrassed about it. Rather, they're proud to be men, but then they often fall off the cliff on the other side, leading to unhelpful, unhealthy, 
ungodly pictures and teaching of what it means to be a man. And so there's errors on both sides. And I'm not trying to say that the middle is the way to go. I'm, you'll hear me say, and this is no surprise, I'm not bearing the lead. Jesus is the way to go. But the, the rush, because over here there's vacuum. People go, well, at least these people are telling me what it means to be a man. And so they rush over there. But these guys are just sending men off a cliff like lemmings into unhelpful, unhealthy, ungodly manhood. I heard someone say something along the lines of, well, obviously I don't like someone like Andrew Tate, who if you don't know about him, don't Google him, uh, Andrew Tate, <clears throat> because even though I don't agree with his treatment or solutions, at least he gets the diagnosis right, to which I think that's foolish thinking. That's like saying, well, at least my doctor acknowledges that cancer exists, uh, but his treatment is more cancer, just a different kind of cancer. It's foolishness. So there's confusion. Uh, I agree with people all across that spectrum, people who disagree on nearly everything else, who are all saying the data tells us is a Christhood, crisis of manhood. Some people shouting that manhood is toxic. Others shouting that manhood is best exemplified by sexual conquest or expensive cars or, or being transgressive. Like just being transgressive is the goal. The more you can agitate people, that's what it looks like to be a man. Others still suggest, actually, there's nothing distinct about men. Men and women are interchangeable. There's nothing distinct about being men. And it's left men very confused, wondering, wondering, and adrift really looking for meaning. And so, uh, first of all, I want to apologise if we haven't spoken about this enough. Because I think we have actually really amazing, awesome men in our community who are great examples, who don't bow to uh, a cultural demand of what a man should look like. They look to what God says about what men should look like. In Australia, speaking of this crisis, um, thank you to Adrian for your work on the ABS website because I've borrowed heavily from it this week. Uh, about three in four men who are struggling with any kind of mental health disorders don't reach out for help. So about 75% about of blokes, if they're struggling, won't reach out for help. I, I suggest this is because the people on this end are telling them you shouldn't be struggling at all. Stoicism. You're a, you're a warrior, just push it down. And people on the other end, other end are saying, what have you got to complain about, you privileged man? So 75% about of Aussie men don't reach out when they need help. This is worse in some industries. I was speaking to a doctor, a senior doctor recently, who was, he was on the verge of tears, like eyes welling up. This is in his workplace. Like, we're not mates. We're just talking in his workplace. And he was talking about the number of his colleagues who have committed suicide over the years <clears throat> and how, <laughs> how the government have brought in a rule that if you suspect somebody, one of your colleagues, medical colleagues, is suffering from any kind of mental health issues, you must report it. And so the, in, the incentive is to not tell anybody lest you use your job or, or have your job you know, on the line. It's a shocking, crazy place to be. Men are killing themselves at a rate of three to one compared to women in Australia. Live on average four years shorter than women. Nearly twice as likely to have a substance abuse disorder. Uh, boys are now, so... 2023, boys are now underperforming girls every level of school in every subject of school. Uh, the, the one um, subject that's been studied to see when men teach this subject boys do better is the one subject, English, that men are least likely to teach. Uh, men are now much less likely to women than women to study at university and more women than men already have degrees and also men are much less likely to go to uni than men now. Uh, and they reckon in, in the near future, uh, two to one will be the ratio of women to men with university degrees. Six out of 10 men are likely to actually finish the qualification even when they get there. 
men are 23 times more likely to die at work in Australia, more likely to be homeless. 93% of Aussies in prison are men. Again, I'm not trying to say men have it harder than women at all. That's, that's not, this is not a, well, women, you've had your turn. Now it's men's turn again. This is absolutely 0% of what I'm trying to say. I'm not trying to join anybody on that spectrum that I just mentioned before. I, I want to identify what is our cultural problem and how might the Bible help us? How might God have set things up in a better way that actually answers some of these problems? I'm not trying to give a list of excuses to men just to, to say this is the deck has been stacked against you to make you feel hopeless or for you to sink into a victim mindset. Not at all. The goal is not to heap shame or guilt onto men or onto women or to anybody or to make anyone feel bad. Just to look at the problem and then paint a picture from Scripture as to what a solution might look like, what manhood was meant to be and for each man here, what your man what your life could look like. That's the goal. To give you the tools of how to realise that picture of manhood in your life, in the life of your sons, in the life of your spiritual sons, anyone you're pouring your life into. That's the goal of today. That's the intro. Let's pray. Ask God to help us today. And so, Father, help us. As we look into your scriptures, help us. Lord, we want to take our cues or our instruction from our culture that changes rapidly and regularly. We want to look to you first and above everything. We want to come into conformity with your son, Jesus. We want to look like him, act like him, think like him, love like him. Relate to you like he does relate to the world like he does. Father, help us in every way to become like Jesus. In his name we ask, amen. So uh, some of the things that make men particularly essential in certain industries where they make up to 99% of the, the workforce and in some crisis situations like size and strength and <clears throat> like one of my sons at least would just run into danger mindlessly without thinking about it. Uh, we might look at that and go, oh man, that's, uh, that's crazy. But in a crisis, sometimes that's something you need. And these kinds of these traits, uh, high testosterone even, has been criticized by our culture, torn down by our culture. Uh, and this is directed into sport. But then anytime those same people will use those same things, size or strength or, again, more testosterone in other areas or behave badly, uh, where we would rightly criticise, people say, well, see, that's, that's manhood. That's what it means. And so you can be biologically male without actually ever growing into a man. And I put it to you, it's becoming more and more endemic in our culture, especially in younger generations. This is why we're doing this talk on Father's Day. My hope is that all of us, uh, men in the room, and women especially, but, but men, I should say men in particular, that we would be looking to those younger men in our lives and drawing a line in the sand and saying, you know what, even though we may not have had the best teaching, we certainly didn't have a culture that example to us and taught us what it looked like to be a good man, a godly man, that the next generation will have men like me. This is you saying, this is you talking now. Men like me. who will show them and teach them what it looks like to be a man. Measure of a man isn't who can bench the most or drink the most or grow the biggest beard or make the most money or have the most toys, bed the most women, uh, attain ultimate stoicism, although these are many of the kinds of things that some of the men on, again, this end of the spectrum are trying to say, this end of the spectrum doesn't know what a man is. Let me tell you what a man is. Man is making a lot of money, bedding a lot of women, looking amazing and being impervious to pain. Pain just bounces, you're so stoic, pain bounces off you like ping pong balls. Marcus Aurelius, got it. That is our culture's caricature of a man. If they hold to there being something distinct about manhood and manliness at all, it's caricature. Caricature, again, gained popularity as other competing visions, including a biblical vision for what it means to be a man. They've all but disappeared from our public discourse. 
and this caricature that remains, it's the loudest. It's the, it's the one that many younger men are gravitating to. And again, they're just rushing to f- jump off that figurative cliff into unhelpful, unhealthy, ungodly manliness, man- manhood. So what is the biblical picture of a man? Let's have a look. From the very beginning, we learn about God making man. This is what he says, Genesis 2. The Lord God took the man, the man he's made in his image, placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to watch over it. So the very first three things we learn about what it means to be a man from the Bible is that man is made in the image of God to reflect God in some way, in some capacity where God has placed that man in the world. That, this, that the man is to build, to grow, to generate. He has work to do and to protect. So let's look at these things. So first, reflecting the image of God where he's placed. For us, this looks like reflecting the image of God where he has placed us. He placed Adam in Eden to bear his image. It's be my reflection in the part of the world I'm placing you. Living in relationship with God and with his creation. To build, to grow. God has put work in front of Adam to do. He's put him in a garden that is flawless. So no sin, but it's not yet perfect. If something's perfect, it cannot be improved upon. Perfection means it's done. It's finished. There's nothing left. God puts Adam in the garden and says, work. There's no sin, but it's not perfect. There's work to be done. Before the fall, work to be done. Work is not a product of the fall. It means we can't look at work and go, oh, it's so tough. I hate this fallen sinful world. No, no, that's not part, that's not part of the fallen sinful world. Perhaps some of the toil part is that comes in the next chapter. But the work is there for our good something that adds to the world, something that does, again, imaging after God, who we've just learned in chapter one, brings order out of chaos. He puts the man into the garden and says, bring order out of chaos. We have wonderful work to do as men in joining with God in his work, generative work of bringing order out of chaos. And to protect from what? What's there to protect the garden from? There's no kids yet. There's no sin yet. What's he protecting this garden from? He's protecting him from the enemy. There's a deceiver. An accuser who prowls around looking for someone to devour. And God says, you're my image. Join with me in my work in the world and beware the accuser. Be on guard for the deceiver. This is the purpose of a man. This is what the very first thing, it's not everything and the only thing. We've got like 10 more minutes, so I'm not going to go into like the full details of what it means to be a man. Although I am going to talk about uh, gender in a couple of weeks' time and we'll, we'll talk more about this then. Purpose of a man, the first thing we learn is to reflect God, build and protect and then he gives him one more. God looks at his creation and he goes, this is good. This is good. Again, any culture that says we don't need man, we don't need a man. We're better off without men. It's foolishness. The creator God, the holy one of heaven, looks at his creation. He says, this is good. He says, but it's not good for man to be alone. And so he makes... Eve, someone suitable for him, compatible, in his, in his same category, ontologically equal. And he tells them, here's the fourth thing, go and fill the earth with my image. He says, you are my image on the, in the world where I've placed you in the, in the garden. Now go and fill the world with my image. Go and do the same everywhere. So God, who is in perfect relationship in himself, made man in his own image, man in his own image, 
a relational being, but yet without a counterpart, makes him a counterpart. And so God makes man, woman together and gives him the charge to procreate. And so the biblical picture of a man from the beginning, again, not exhaustive, but the very first things we learn, image of God, build, protect, procreate. What is a picture of a picture of manhood? If we take a, like a high level view of the rest of Scripture, we see that the picture of manhood is actually, I think, best represented as a father. This is how the Bible continually picks up this view of what is like. What's the end? The end, obviously, is Christ likeness. That's true for women as well. So, what is what is it that is distinctive about men uh, in terms of what we're aiming for? What it looks like this biblical picture? It's of a father. Paul laments. He says, man, there are many teachers, lots of experts, lots of TikTok influencers. He didn't say that. That's kind of the, my, my paraphrase. But there are so few fathers. He says, where are the fathers? Where are the men? Not the boys with a YouTube account and a million subscribers. Where are the fathers? provide, protect, procreate. I'm not limiting that to biological men either when I say procreation. Paul didn't have any biological kids, but he writes to young men who he calls his sons. He says, you're my son in the spirit. You're my son in the faith. He's pouring pouring himself into younger men and women, actually. I think fatherhood is the call in every man's life, actually. Again, not just or necessarily only biological fatherhood, which means if you are a biological dad, your fathering role is not limited to just those who share your DNA. And it means if you are not a biological father, that you, it means you are no less able to father men and women around you. In particular, in our culture today, we need young men who have fathers. I've seen, actually, a number of times, young men and older men who don't have father figures in their lives. I've seen them radically change their life when an older man comes in and says, I'll be your dad. I've seen people change religions. Actually, multiple people change religions. Like the thing that these men held deepest and dearest to themselves was able to be swayed by the investment of an older man who didn't necessarily say, I'll be your dad, but just started fathering. Some people who have picked up their lives out of the figurative gutter because of a father figure. I've seen men whose lives have been sent off the rails following a father figure. Just a bad, just a bad father figure. Jesus had no biological children, but it's called by Isaiah everlasting father. Not to be confused with God the Father. But because Jesus did the work of a father, he provided, he protected, and he procreated in the sense of he made many sons and daughters. It's the work of a father. It's the work of every man. We need men who use their strength to protect, to provide, put their energy into making sons and daughters. Here are some recent stats. Talking about Children from fatherless homes. And please, as I, as I say this, this is not in any sense a dig at single mums who I've said so many times are my heroes. Single mums are my heroes. People in, my wife and I, in our lives who are single mums or have been single mums. My sister was a single mum for us. Some of our closest friends have been single mums. We love single mums. There's not a slight, in a sense, at all. Single mums. They're the ones, they're the heroes, bringing order out of chaos left by males who can procreate but abdicate the role of father, the duty to provide and protect. Here's some of the stats. Of youth suicides, 63% come from fatherless homes. 70% of juveniles in correctional facilities come from fatherless homes. 71% of all high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. 71% of uh, pregnant teenagers come from fatherless homes, 75% of all adolescents in chemical abuse centres come from fatherless homes, 80% of rapists motivated with displaced anger, four out of five 
come from fatherless homes. 85% of all youth who exhibit behaviour disorders come from fatherless homes. 90% of all homeless and runaway teenagers come from fatherless homes. It's not to say that there aren't any of those categories that come from really wonderful, loving families. What it shows is there's something significant about fathers. Men and women are not interchangeable. That, that women and mums bring something essential and necessary as mothers. We talked about this on Mother's Day. And men bring something necessary, distinct and essential as men, as fathers. We need them. We need good men. When men hear masculinity is toxic, <clears throat> they hear you should minimise and mitigate those traits that make you uniquely a man. And we need other voices like yours and mine and other examples that say, no, it's not. We need men. We unapologetically need men. And when we say that, we're not joining people again over here. We're not kind of co-signing with those people. We're saying, actually, that is wrong too. It's not that they get the diagnosis right, but the treatment wrong. We need good men who don't shirk work, but step into those good works God has prepared in advance for them to walk in who don't shirk responsibility but are generative in their communities, who don't shy back from danger but will protect their families, pray for their families, stand in between danger and their family. Again, their biological family, their church family, those sons and daughters who don't share their DNA but they're pouring their lives into. We need men who do these things. We need men who make sons and daughters, who take responsibility for themselves and for their community, who pursue and invest in their family, who example for their family, who lay down their lives for their family. And by that I don't necessarily mean, I'm not limiting that to just actually like physically dying for your family, although that time might come, unlikely but might come. But when I say die for your family, I mean actually laying down your life for your family. Not just dying, like ceasing your life, but rather laying down your life while you're living. Dying to self, dying to selfish ambition. Not ambition, but selfish ambition. Dying to laziness, dying to self-gratification. Not joy and enjoyment, but self-gratification. That's what, that's what it looks like to be a man. Men, what does it look like for us as a community? And women, we need your help to support us in this as well because we need more voices, not just men's voices, we need women's voices as well, saying, no, no, we need, we need men. Not sheepishly, not saying, well, the data says, but we're going to be cautious about saying it because we don't want to whatever, whatever. No, 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 we say, actually, no. God has made us male and female. We need men. We need good men. We need men who are fathers, imaging after God, the Heavenly Father. Generatively building, providing, protecting, and making more sons and daughters? What does it look like for us to jettison unhelpful, mistaken, worldly ideas of manhood and instead pursuing this vision of manhood we see right in the very beginning? You know what sucks about that vision? is that it was ruined so quickly, actually. See, Adam, even though he's given these things and starts pretty well, he abdicates his responsibility so quickly. So for all of us men and for women as well, we don't just need men, we need the man, the one that Paul calls the second Adam. We need the man as well. As we come to the table, we need to remember while the first Adam failed to live up to this picture of manhood and we will fail, that we have in Jesus, the second Adam, who was the perfect man, the perfect example who was perfectly generative, perfectly provided for his family, who perfectly protected his family, who has made many, many sons and daughters. Remember him. The corrective, the corrective of, you know, like Disney movies back in the day was damsel in distress, you know, man goes and slays a dragon, saves a woman. And the last like 20 years, Disney went, that's not right. 
uh, you don't need, I, don't need, I don't need no man to make me happy. Uh, the answer's in me. I, I'm, I'm going to be the one to save myself. Uh, they do this corrective. Like, well, we don't need a man to save me. Actually, no, it's not about men saving women. It's about the man who saved us. We are the damsel in distress, actually. We are the one oppressed by the dragon. We are the ones that couldn't save ourselves. We are the one that needs the man to come and save us. That's what those stories are telling us. Not, hey, man, you should get a sword, and that's what manliness looks like, go be a sword. Although there are elements of that in terms of protecting and providing, like I said before. We look to those, and it echoes the gospel story, the great dragon slayer, Jesus, the man who came and saved us from the dragon. And Jesus, we find the exemplified, exemplary model of manhood, who's compassionate but not weak, strong but not oppressive, authoritative but not authoritarian. He valued men and women. He broke cultural norms in order to be the man. Didn't shy away from it. Didn't sink into the cultural caricature, but rather he was the perfect man and our perfect example. And so as we come to the table, we remember, firstly, we need men. Men, don't shy away from being men. Don't run to the unhelpful, unhealthy, ungodly caricature of men. Run to the perfect example we have in Christ. Go to the men who are in this community who are doing the same already. Say, let's be men together. Let's search. Again, we, I'm, I'm done talking about men, right? So there's so much more we could say, and we need to say. We're not going to say it today, but we need to, we need to keep saying it. And for all of us, as we look to Jesus, we see, we see the man. He, he is the everlasting Father. Again, not to be confused with God the Father. He's one who's made many sons and daughters. He's one who took responsibility for his family. He's one who stood in, in the path of danger and protected us, saved us. He is the wonderful perfect man and as we gather around the table we remember his sacrifice for us by, by his blood he has covered over all of our sin covered over every stain, removed all shame and with his body he has borne the penalty of our sin so when we're talking about a perfect sacrifice it means it is, it's done it's finished, there is no more sacrifice to do, he's done it Our response is gratitude. Our response is thankfulness. Our response is boldly stepping into those good works he's prepared in advance for us to walk in. Not so that we would get his attention, not so that we would get his love, but because in the cross of Christ we have seen he already loves us perfectly. It's wonderful. So let's come, men and women, gather around the table, remember Jesus, then we're going to lift up our voices and worship him together. Let's do it.